Uh, hi, so my name is Natasha. I'm uh, an investor with Beyond Net Zero, which is the climate venture of General Atlantic. Uh, for those who don't know it, General Atlantic is a growth equity investor with a 40 plus year track record of investing in high growth tech enabled companies, typically taking significant minority stakes in these companies and providing capital to scale. Um, and early last year, GA set up this new venture, Beyond Net Zero, together with, with the founders of Beyond Net Zero, to apply that same approach that they've taken historically, but to the climate space. So that means we apply additional lens, which is looking at the greenhouse gas emission reduction potential of each of our investee companies, uh, but looking for the same great entrepreneurs, great business models, um, and providing with growth capital. Um, we partner with a firm called Systemic, who help us assess the emissions reduction potential of our investments. And we also com commit to setting science-based targets for each of our investee companies. And we've made five investments to date, the most recent of which was in Ecovadis. Um, it's our first investment in Europe, and actually, I think we first met at this conference last year. Um, so delighted to be joined today by Pierre-Francois, uh, the co-CEO of Ecovadis, who founded the business with his partner, Frederick, back in 2007. It's a great business model using innovative technology with a bold ambition for decarbonization and a great example of how Beyond Net Zero looks to back high quality, high growth companies making a significant impact both near and long term. Um, the theme of our panel today is the importance of sustainability across supply chains, which is the driving mission for Ecovadis. Um, so maybe we'll start there. Pierre-Francois, thank you for joining me. Do you want to do a quick intro to Ecovadis and, and your focus on supply chains? Yes. Um, so first, really glad to be here with you today. And uh, indeed, we first met with the Beyond the Zero team at uh, this event just a year ago. And uh, six months later, we were able to close this uh, $500 million uh, funding round. And I know Marco is tracking you know, all the you know, millions of dollars which have been raised following meetings at, uh, at NOAA. I think this one can really you know, definitely be credited to, uh, to you. And uh, you know, my best hope for all of you today that you will make the connections with the, the right partners and that you will be able to announce also you know, big, uh, big partnerships in the coming, uh, in the coming month. So, Ecovedis, indeed, we are a um, you know, purpose-led business. Our mission is to guide all companies toward a sustainable world. And uh, back in uh, 2007, when we started, you know, we saw the huge potential of global supply chain in terms of you know, creating scale and helping you know, drive improvements in you know, environmental and social, uh, social performance. So, that was our, that was our starting point. And uh, today, we are operating a you know, global platform, you know, comprising ratings. You know, we do business sustainability ratings and a SaaS collaborative platform which is helping, uh, I think we'll have close to 1,000 large enterprises at the end of the year, so 1,000 of the largest global procurement organizations, you know, collaborate with 125 businesses in 175 countries and, you know, pushing those businesses to improve on, uh, on the E, on the S, on the, on the G. And, uh, and all this is supported by, a, you know, a global team. We have 1,500 people now uh, across the planet from a Tokyo, I was two weeks ago, to uh, you know, San Francisco. Brilliant. And, and taking a step back to the very beginning, what was it that initially drew you to supply chains? So my background was in supply chain. You know, I uh, always worked as an entrepreneur, as a practitioner, you know, building you know, supply chain systems, supply chain infrastructure, you know, marketplaces to connect uh, buyers and suppliers and you know, to transact financial information. And at some point, I... Uh, started to be a bit less excited by this you know, financial information and I realized that those marketplaces, those uh, you know, B2B networks could be used for a better purpose, which was to you know, create and, and, and transact you know, reliable ESG, uh, ESG data. So partly due to my, to my roots. And what we saw at this time is you know, there, were, there, there is a huge complexity in global value chains. And all of the focus at that time, and even today, is on the large corporates. You know, all the scrutiny of NGOs, the scrutiny of investors is on the top, you know, 5,000, 10,000 companies in the world. But they only account for, you know, 20% of global emissions. Uh, uh, you know, the biggest part, for example, of your, your human rights violations are in upstream supply chains. So if you want to drive change, you know, that's where you need to act. And that's much more complicated, you know, complicated due to the 
the numbers, basically. You know, we, uh, we think that there are 4 million businesses you know, operating in global supply chain, and so if you want to drive this change, you need to impact not only the large uh, 5,000 or 10,000, but uh, you know, tens of thousands of those uh, businesses. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think, as you say, this is complex. It's not going to happen overnight within a supply chain. Um, and the first step is for companies to really understand who their suppliers are and what levers they have to drive decarbonization. Um, I think one of the things we love about your business model is the natural network effects that you benefit from. So your enterprise customers bringing in their suppliers, which then starts to drive transparency throughout a vertical. So you can have entire industries, be it automotive or retail, starting to drive industry-wide rankings and, and benchmarking. Um, maybe to, to think about the sort of steps that companies can take to decarbonize. What, in your view, are the steps to accelerating decarbonization at scale? Yes. So, so we, we, we are looking at 21 criteria. You know, um, ES and G and uh, part of environment. We're looking at waste and biodiversity. But you know, climate is obviously uh, you know one of the criteria we're looking at and one of the most in, important criteria, as you uh, as you all know. And it's. You know, it's quite widely accepted now that you know, 80 percent of you know carbon emissions are not within the four walls of the largest company, but in scope three and actually, essentially in upstream supply chain. So that that's where you need to fix the the problem. It's a very complex problem because the maturity of those millions of SMBs and medium-sized businesses is very low. Two years ago, when we when we looked at the Ecovadis data on uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of businesses, we saw that only 15% of those companies were actually able to measure and report on scope one and scope two. You know, it's higher for the large companies, but uh, you know, across the board, it's only 15% businesses. So we know that we need to do a massive uh, U-turn you know, in terms of decarbonization in the next uh, you know, eight, 10 years. But how can you do it you know, if only 15% of companies are, are measuring? So we decided that we needed to go further and we needed to take you know, much more action on, on, on carbon. So one of the concrete actions was to launch what we call the Carbon Action Module, which is a combination of software and you know, validated uh, you know, data, uh, you know, deeper scorecards and deeper ratings on, on, on carbon to help our customers like uh, General Motors or Unilever or uh, you know, Nestlé you know, really push their suppliers to improve on you know, their carbon maturity and to improve on this carbon uh, engagement. We launched this 18 months ago, and we set a target by the end of this year to have 15,000 companies starting to report on carbon uh, on the platform. At the end of last month, we were at uh, 12,000, so you know, we still need to make a big push. But what we've seen is we are at the end of the first year cycle. So we've seen that companies were at the, you know, entering the second year of assessment. 60% of them are making a significant improvement you know, in their carbon engagement, carbon measurement, and so on, partly thanks to the data we provide, partly because you know, the large enterprise, the large procurement organizations are setting up goals, you know, are, are saying, OK, this carbon rating will now account for 5 10 20% in our you know, business award decisions. Brilliant. Um, and I think our, our last question, maybe, uh, what implications do you think sustainability ratings have for investors and for entrepreneurs? So sustainability ratings, um, first for investors, and I think, uh, I think in this room, you know, it's mainly you know, private equity uh, investors. I think it's going to change a lot the way you need to manage your uh, investment strategies. So today, ESG in private equity, it's a lot. Okay, you need to report to your LPs. Uh, I would not say a random set of uh, ESG KPIs, but you know, diverse set of ESG KPIs. I think this is going to change, and they will be much more focused on validated information, validated rating. Actually, we launched last year a new solution for GPs. This is one of the helping GPs manage ESG in their portfolio. This is one of the fastest growing uh, segments for Covadis. We have now. Uh, for more than 450 billion of assets under management, which are you know, using our, our, our solution. And so for, for GPs, I think if five years from now, you know, companies in your portfolio don't have an above average ESG performance, it will be as difficult to sell them or as difficult to IPO them than if today you have a company with a you know, below average uh, Glassdoor or below average uh, customer satisfaction score. 
So that's for, uh, that's for our GPs. And for, uh, you know, startups and for, you know, companies in the room, I think the reason ratings can be very useful for you is those ratings are helping grow your TAM in a way. You know, the more, uh, the more businesses need to improve, the more businesses need to find solutions. So I will advise you to look at how those ratings are built and see how you, can, how you can contribute to your solution, through your solution, to helping improve the rating of your customers. But that, that, it's, a great, uh, it's a great selling tool. And, uh, hey, and you won't want me to go into rating my speakers because you are way over. We have 350 <laughs> speakers. Thank you. We have to get going. I'm very, very sorry. Thank I you. Thank you. <laughs>